Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for hearing this case. Allison Corey, representing Mr. McAuliffe. This case could, could end up blurring the lines between what is civil and what is criminal. It could open the floodgates for the use of our criminal justice system to resolve what should be resolved in a civil forum. But it's also very fact specific. I mean, it really is a question of whether the evidence is sufficient to suggest it, a, an intent to defraud. An it does go to the, the sufficiency of the facts, Your Honor. People who have been in a business deal that has gone bad feel wronged. And sometimes they've been misled, or they've been duped, or they've been conned, and, and isn't that, that could usually be. a question of that? It could be. A bad business deal. Who wouldn't want the power and might of the police and the district attorney's office trying to collect their loan for them? But that's not a proper use of the system. So we must look to see, is this case truly criminal, or is it a civil case occasioned by the bad real estate market, contaminated property, and a poor economic environment. Well, when you start writing bad checks on accounts you know you've, that have been closed, that, that suggests to me some evidence that you, I mean, that's, that's really not your typical civil case, is it? Well, Intentional it, deprivation? I mean, I'm not saying that goes to the inducement, but there is some evidence of intentional deprivation. Well, money in the, the record, uh, in, the con in the record, in the context of that specific act of writing that check. On an account closed that six or seven months Six or before. seven months, and it was written six or seven months after the loan was made. It wasn't written in conjunction Understood. with the loan. It was written after. And this, it was written to give some comfort to the lender who had no documentation at all. It was a evidence, poor there was substitute evidence, for but a- But there was evidence of a whole series of lies. Um, oh. I would it's, disagree, Your Honor. In March, it's imminent. I have an imminent, it's the, the sale is imminent. No, it wasn't imminent at all. There's no the evidence it was imminent. The record contains nothing to show that it wasn't imminent. All we have is the non-performance, the failure to but actually didn't, sell didn't the Didn't at the property. very beginning in August, that's the first loan, right? Correct. Uh, there's a suggestion, I think maybe in your brief and certainly in the in the, something I've read of Mr. Dooling's testimony, that your client said, in substance, it was sold for two hundred thousand dollars. Yes, I have to clean it up, but it was sold for two hundred. That he that it that the buyer was there. Um, there was a deal subject to cleaning up. There wasn't any deal, was there? The record contains nothing to show that there was no deal. It was six months later that the the possible sale fell through. The the record, the evidence, the testimony is consistent. At the time of the loan, the defendant needed, he asked for a loan. Okay, his bank account didn't have any money. That's why people borrow money. Okay, so his, no, no, the lack of funds question, is no evidence. It's just the question of what, what he represented in terms of a, uh, having a buyer there. And I, I guess my question is, at the skipping to May or March or May, uh, when there is clearly no buyer, you couldn't infer back that there wasn't one in August either? That is not a reasonable inference, especially I given the type of property, a commercial property that used to house an auto repair shop. The contamination element is is more than reasonable. Yes, that's uh, right. So it, why would you think there would be a buyer? It could be. Commercial property sells. If, <coughs> if the tests had come back clean, for example, if there hadn't been the extensive contamination, perhaps that, that sale would have gone through and we wouldn't be here. But at the time, you have to look at the statement that was made at the time. I'm selling the property. I have a buyer lined up. I'm going to give you the money back as soon as I have it sold. There is nothing to contradict that in the record, nothing at all. Now, every case in Massachusetts that has upheld a larceny by fraud conviction in the context of a loan has had very, very clear evidence of the falsity of the statement. 
There are three cases in particular cited, I believe, in both of our briefs. Hamlin. The Commonwealth introduced evidence that the defendant had given the lender falsified business records in order to induce the loan. Huh? Stovall. The defend that Commonwealth introduced evidence that the defendant said, hey, I need 20000 for my payroll. And they also introduced evidence that he didn't even have a business, let alone payroll. Very clear false statements. In Lewis, most recently, 1999, the defendant told the lender, I'm starting a legal business at 75 State Street. I need some money. I'm going to use prominent attorneys. Then the Commonwealth introduced the testimony of the manager of 75 State Street. Never heard of the guy, of the lawyers. What legal services business? Very, very clear evidence of the falsity of the statement. There is nothing in the record in this case to show so that it was no, false. There's no, no evidence that when the representation was made that there was a buyer, that that was false? There is no evidence of the falsity of the statement. Now, was there a motion for judgment of acquittal at the close of the there prosecution was. case? Yes. Okay, so we're focused on the close of the property because he did testify that he didn't own the property. It was owned by a realty trust of which he is the sole beneficiary. He, he t the testimony was that his lawyer, who was actually trial counsel, was the trustee of the realty trust. But you can you can the, rely on the Commonwealth's case anyway, right? Because you did have a motion for a quick, you had a motion for a direct advert. I mean for. A, Required, required finding, finding yes. yeah, yes. at the close of the Commonwealth's case. Now, what the Commonwealth could have done to show the falsity of the statement is introduce some evidence on that. Now, there is one, in one case. But isn't there a reasonable inference that, that the representation was, well, I'm going to clean the property up, the property wasn't cleaned up? And isn't there some inference there that, that, that the property was not able to be cleaned up? No? No, I don't believe so, Your Honor. One wouldn't really know that until all of the environmental tests come to a head. But that so goes to I don't point. think that's a reasonable inference. But that, but, but that goes to a point here, and that is whether or not the representation, I've got a buyer for $200,000, I've just got to clean the property up, um, whether that's a misrepresentation. I've just got to clean the property up. One thinks of removing trash as opposed to environmental tests on a commercial property, which is a whole different kettle of fish. Well, the money was very extensive. When I think automotive business, I think environmental problems. I guess it's a matter of the interpretation of the person hearing it. But cert well, and certainly Mr. Dooling testified that he, he, there was no conversation about environmental testing. That it was just his understanding of the conversation was he just had to clean up the, you know, get the trash off there. I take it it was an old building on there as well. Maybe that had to be taken down. That could have been uh, his interpretation. Uh, the younger that was dueling, intention intentionally so. The younger dueling uh, tes testimony was more environmental related. So I don't think yeah, it later was. Later on when the, when the younger was pressing for the money, well, there's However, the tests. older dueling, um, his testimony did say that his son was present at the earlier, con with the earlier conversation of the initial loans. And um, I, I realized that uh, I had forgotten about that until I reread through uh, his testimony in the transcript. So I don't think it's a reasonable The son said no, so the, that's a question of fact. The son said he only found out about it when he saw these checks, mm -hmm. the copies of the certified checks in his father's house and wondered what, what was Let this? Me, if I could give you, um, because we're looking at the facts in the right, light most favorable to the Commonwealth, what the judge could have concluded and inferred from all of the testimony, the entire course of conduct of whether there was misleading information provided in order to induce the, the loans. That's what the judge is doing. Again, the record is specific. The, that is the element that was contested, the falsity of the statement. All the record before you is that he said, I have a buyer lined up. I'm going to clean it up. All I have to do is clean back. up the property. Yep. And perhaps the intention was to, could the judge conclude that that was a little misleading, maybe more than a little misleading? 
He did. Up, there was no specific finding well, about the, that. Well, Mr. Dooling was asked, did you understand that meant environmental cleanup? He said, no, I, I just thought that meant just cleaning the trash and other stuff off the property. Environmental testing is a real risky business in a mm -hmm. place like this. That's and a whole different uh, set of risks than I've got to clean the trash off the property. If I could, this would be have solved everything. Assuming it was a false statement, to this day, the property suffers from contamination and it has been since torn down. Um, however, this is what the Commonwealth could have done. Get the bank records. Very easy. You show the deposits going into the defendant's bank account, 2540, the big chunks of money going in. How is it coming out? Is it on uh, TVs at Best Buy, living expenses? Or are the chunks going out to something too? But that was well within the power of the Commonwealth. That's not hard to do. Well, but they, we're, we're, they did not introduce any evidence of the falsity. It, their case rests on inference upon inference. Well, inference is okay. And a course of con looking at the entire course of conduct to determine whether or not some of the initial representations were misrepresentations intended to induce, induce that's okay. This isn't just a question of, I never got paid off on the loan, therefore I've been defrauded. That's not this it, case. It, it borders that case. It's, it's you think? close. I do hey, think here's so. Here's a check. We closed on the property. <laughs> you can cash it now. I'm off to Florida. See you later. Bank account closed six months before. I, this is not. But that, that closing of the bank account, the, the check written six months later, is not evidence about whether or not that statement it's, was false six it's, months It's earlier. evidence about the, the overall intent and, and deceit that this individual is. I mean, I'm, it, it's mm -hmm. evidence of his course of conduct. It's not conclusive on the point. Not I mean, necessarily, Your Honor. A scheme, a monetary scheme, it's, it's perpetuated by deferment, by delay, by buying more time, 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 time. It makes no sense that the defendant would tell them to cash a check on a closed account. It makes no sense. It would, it would bring. And then he disappears. Uh, He's no longer available, no longer at his place of business, no longer reachable by phone. That's the evidence. Well, the, test, the testimony was that when they couldn't reach him, that's when they had the meeting. That's when he wrote this check. No, I don't think so. But in any event, that's, that'll be mm -hmm. the evidence in the record. But let us assume this. Could the court have concluded that that the defendant here uh, was looking, you know, maybe I can sell this piece of property here. I know this guy, he can loan me some money. He doesn't, he's, he's an older gentleman, you know, and I've, I've done this, gone down this road with him before. Um, so maybe I can sell this property if I can just figure out how to do it and I need some money to do that and I, you know. So you come and say, hey, I've got a buyer, 200,000. You can make 10,000 real quick. Just give me 70,000 and, and I'll just clean it up. Mm -hmm. Couldn't that be a misrepresentation? And he was hoping maybe he could right. get a buyer, but yeah. the way it was sold was not the way it was. He never represented that there was a P and S or that oh, there was something specific. but I have a buyer, specific. two hundred thousand. I have a buyer for two hundred thousand. All I have to do is clean the property up. Isn't and that? maybe there was, but it couldn't happen because of the it couldn't be cleaned up. But there was no. The record is. Well, if you it's say void. if you say I have a buyer versus I hope I can get a buyer. Well, how buyer, close, isn't how that a misrepresentation of risk? What about if he said, I have a buyer lined up? Does that categorize it more? It's. That's pretty good. What should we say? And, and wouldn't it then be. I mean, this was a seasoned lawyer, a retired lawyer who, who was doing these undocumented transactions with the defendant. Shouldn't he bear some responsibility. There was no documentation. There was no investigate. He didn't look into anything. Was he when he didn't he was get paid, he, he just called the police. Is there a mortgage? Uh, no. Did, was there any testimony as to why there was not a mortgage on this property? He, the te he was familiar with loan, document, loan documentation procedures. He's familiar with the civil process, but that he didn't just didn't do it. Let the state collect for me. Let let the police and the district attorney's office handle this because I think I've been criminally duped. And this system, he has redress in the civil system. We can't let the criminal system be used in this way, especially 
on this record where there is no specific evidence of the falsity. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. May it please the court, my name is Donna Marie Heron, Assistant District Attorney representing the Commonwealth. There was ample circumstantial evidence presented for the fact finder, in this case the judge, to determine that the defendant made the false statement of, I have a property sold for $200,000 and all I need is to have the property clean up, remove junk and debris from the property, and I need the money for that. that was so how did you disprove that? How did you prove that that was false? Through a continuous course of the defendant's conduct, it was shown that it was false, that when the defendant and his son, the defendant initially gave the defendant, uh, the victim a check written in the wrong amounts, 8,000. That was, that was in May and the first loan here was in August. Yes. And every time he loaned him money, he kept saying, I need, just need to clean up the property. I have it sold. It's eminent. It's, it's going to be sold. I just need the, the money. And each time the victim testified, he gave him money. He was saying, it's almost there. It's really eminent. I just need the money. And the last loan was in, um, March 17th of 2006, and he, the victim testified he anticipated being repaid a month or two later. Two months go by, no repayment. He goes to the defendant. The defendant first gives him a check on a, a written wrong. The son sees this, and I dispute my sister's representation that the son was at the meetings. I believe the evidence from the record shows that the son, after seeing all this money being loaned, was when he came into the picture. They then see that the check has been written in the wrong. The son and the father then again confront the defendant. I think they track him down at a restaurant. They go to his place of business. He then writes him out a check on an account that was closed six months earlier and says, this is all ready. Can you hold it off for a few days and then clear it? He then gets a phone message from the defendant saying, it's all set, property sold, you can cash a check. And when the victim goes to cash a check, it's um, returned back for insufficient funds. And then the property was never sold. And the, the victim testified he then repeatedly, after this encounter, not before, repeatedly calls him, goes to his place of business, and the defendant is nowhere to be seen or heard and doesn't return the phone calls. And I would suggest all that is circumstantial evidence that the Victim, that the defendant lied to the defendant when he made the specific representation of, I have a buyer, $200,000, it is going to be sold, all I need it is to clean up the property. But he couldn't clean it debris. up. He couldn't clean it up. That's the problem. That was the contingency, and, and that, it turns out he couldn't clean it up. Well, as you brought up, I think there's a world of difference between environmental problems, I need to do tests, to I'm just cleaning up the property, removing debris and stuff. And the victim testified he was and never And wouldn't you have to have told. evidence that... I mean, if it's a if it's it's a gas station, is that right? Uh, I believe they sold cars. I don't don't think it was a gas station. I believe they sold automobiles there, okay, if so, I recall. So I mean, but why is it? Where is the evidence that there was not an arrangement, and he would hope to clean the property up, and it either cost more than he thought, or it turned out that the property was not appropriately cleaned to be sold? There is circumstantial evidence. There is no direct evidence, but as you know, there can be, the case can be tried on circumstantial, reasonable inferences. And when the defendant gives a check that it says it's all clear, the property is cleared up, you're ready to go, it shows his mind tent that he never had the property sold for $200,000. And the fact that he never told the victim it's for environmental problems, he only told them, yeah, I just have to clean up the property, remove debris and junk, I think is a turns us I'm into sorry, a the, criminal uh, The evidence matter. says he had to remove debris and junk? Or yes, your... it's on page 18 of the transcript. Um, I had to remove debris, junk. That's how the victim... And, and a reasonable person would assume that that would cost $70,000? If you had to remove a building, I believe there was a building on there that had to be removed. Did he, t did he say that that was part of the, the, the cleanup cost, <clears throat> removing a building? He said remove debris and junk. I don't think it ever got into the building. But he was specifically, though, never told, and he testified this, that it was an environmental problem. And I think at a reasonable person, that would change the ballgame for someone, being an environmental soil test problem, so I just have to remove junk from the... But you've, the got, you've got an attorney here, and he's, he's already had a bad deal with this guy. He already gave him money. He already had to go to the sheriff to collect. He was getting f uh, about 40% interest annually. Here he's getting 40% interest if the deal had gone down. I mean, this is not a typical deal. No, it's not a typical and deal, but I believe that the evidence shows that. But, but I mean, even also, I mean, he, there's a se sequence of requests, and wouldn't somebody reasonable, particularly an attorney, say after the second one, what's the deal? Debris and junk is costing me $70,000? 
It's not the reasonableness of the victim. It's what the defendant's statement is. that false? Is, did he give him a false statement when he says, I have this property sold? I just need, and the, the victim testified every time he gave him money, the, the defendant said to him, I have this property sold. I just need a little bit more. And the, relying on that representation, the victim proceeded to give him money. It's not whether the victim was reasonable in that. It's whether there was a false statement made at the time that to which the victim relied upon in, in giving him the money back. And the Commonwealth suggests that the evidence shows that, that I have a piece of property sold for $200,000 and I just need some money to remove junk and debris is a false statement. And through the circumstantial evidence, it was shown that that was false. And the victim relied upon that when he gave the loan. What do you say about your sister's concern that there was no evidence that the money was not indeed devoted to the cleanup of the property? I think that the evidence I've restated is circumstantial evidence to show that that was a false statement. Uh, there's no, I concede, there's no direct you know, evidence. Do we know that the, ev uh, that the money was not spent to clean up the property? Well, we know that the defendant didn't even own the property, but that well, you came see, in you, after. And then, you, you, the, the, that came, I that can't came out later, that, I gather. But you say, but, but she says he was the beneficiary, so you're saying that's irrelevant? It was, I think, the, the, but right before, and this again doesn't come in, this came in the defense case, but the defendant actually, the prosecutor was like, so you own this property? He says, yes, you bought this property. He says, yes. He then shows him the deed and says, isn't it true in 2000 or whatever, so-and-so bought the property? And that's when he starts retracting, saying, oh, well, it's in a trust. I'm the trustee. He then asked the defendant again, well, do you have any sale and purchase agreement? Do you have any receipts from the soil testing you claim? The defendant had but none that's, of that. that's all irrelevant because it's all in the defendant's yes. case. Yes, as I said, that is all in the defendant's case. So we have to look at it at the close of the Commonwealth's case, and I suggest to you that it's a reasonable enough circumstantial evidence for the fact finder to determine themselves whether this is criminal, whether there was criminal intent, or whether it's purely civil. At that point, it's up for the fact finder, because in the light most favorable to the Commonwealth, there was sufficient circumstantial evidence to show an intent to defraud when, he, when he, the victim gave his money. But the intent to defraud, you agree, it has to be at the time the money is received. At the time he gives it, and that intent to defraud is, I have a property sold for $200,000. I just need money to clean, remove debris, and clean it up. If there's no further questions, come on, the rest of it's brief. Thank you. Thanks.